I think it's fitting that we're sitting here today to talk about Madeline's book, Fascism, A Warning, because I don't know how many people go back and know the real history of the birth of modern Aspen and the role that Pepke's played, but at the end of World War II, when they came here to celebrate Goethe's bicentennial in 1948, which was the birth of the Aspen Institute, the ski company, the music festival, all came out of that. The reason the Pepkis had that meeting that was so instrumental in changing Aspen from a ghost town into what it is today was anti-fascism. The Pepkis were German-Americans. They were upset and, and shocked by the, what happened to their Germany under Hitler and the Nazism, and at the end of the war, the whole idea of having a Goethe Bicentennial was to go back into German culture and history and show what a great nation it had always been before it was brought to its knees by Hitler. So it's fitting that you're here to talk to us about fascism and someone who actually fled it not once but twice is here to tell us that it's still a clear and present danger to democracies around the world in the 21st century. So Madeline, what is the fascism that you see that you're warning us about today? Well, first of all, um, it is unfortunately germane to speak about it. And um, by the way, I also am so grateful to the Explorer. All six of my books have had some introduction here it's made all the difference. So thank you very, very much. And local bookstores are the strength of America. So thank you very much for that. Um, uh, all the books that I've written have had a, a certain element um, of uh, personal interest for a number of reasons. But this one really has, because as now been said a couple of times, um, I was born in Czechoslovakia in 1937, two years before World War II. Um, and um, what happened was my father was a Czechoslovak diplomat. Um, he managed to escape, and we spent the war in England, and he was with the government in exile. When um, I, I really didn't know my grandparents, I have pictures of myself with them, but I was two when we left. And when we came back, I didn't realize the fact uh, because I now say this with trepidation as a grandmother I, myself, is they were old and they died. And that was kind of what happened. I did not find out about my own heritage until I became Secretary of State and found out, um, by the way, I was raised a Catholic, married an Episcopalian, and found out I was Jewish. And so uh, <laughs> what I then, so I have my interfaith discussions by myself. Um, uh, and. So what I did find out was that 26 members of my family actually died in the Holocaust. And um, what happened to a country such as Czechoslovakia that had come into existence in 1918 with the help of the United States and Woodrow Wilson, all of a sudden was the victim of this horrible plague of fascism. And so um, that was the personal reason for writing the book, but I also felt that we needed to understand what was going on now. And I, I will just say this up front, I was gonna write this book no matter who had gotten elected, because I wanted to know what was creating the divisions uh, in the United States and all over Europe in terms of people um, hating each other and blaming somebody else for the problems. And so I started doing a lot of research on fascism. And so a lot about this book is historic. And I begin with Mussolini. Um, and we were talking about it. He truly was um, a, a fascinating character in so many different ways who had come, who was an outsider, who ultimately became the hero of Italy at the time, um, and was able to play off of the differences that were in Italian society then. Um, I have to say, the best quotes in the book are from Mussolini. First of all, he actually said, drain the swamp in Italian. Um, <laughs> But the very best quote in the whole book is from him, and it said, if you pluck one, a chicken one feather at a time, nobody notices. Um, there is a lot of feather plucking going on now. Uh, those are two words that are hard to say quickly together. Uh, uh, 
but uh, the reason that I wanted to write the book was to kind of explain that it's small steps that take place that people don't notice and that really are looking at how uh, fascism takes place. And the part that blew my mind, frankly, is, uh, as I did more research, was that both Mussolini and Hitler came to power by constitutional means. In Italy, um, things were going badly. King Emmanuel uh, turned power over to Mussolini. And in Germany, things were also going badly after the Weimar Republic. Von Hindenburg constitutionally turned power over um, to Hitler. And the countries that I study in this book in the modern era uh, are Hungary, where there have been elections, Poland, Turkey, um, uh, the Philippines, Venezuela, um, those Hungary. are countries, and Hungary, yes, all were countries where elections put the people into place. And so, what is fascism? And fascism is not an ideology. It is a process whereby to gain power. And it's a term that's thrown around an awful lot. Um, I did pick up, and I was just showing this, there is a there was an op-ed in the papers that said, please cool the Hitler rhetoric before someone else gets hurt. Um, but I think we have to call things what they are. And fascism, as I said, is not an ideology. It is a process whereby um, there is the identification by a demagogic leader with a group, which is a tribal kind of group, um, showing the identity that they have in common against another group that is then totally isolated in every single way. Um, and it is a, uh, a recognition um, that that is what's important, that tribal identity and um, the hatred of the other. Then what is true is has no use for democratic, any kind of institutions whatsoever. Um, and it operates, the demagogic leader takes over and thinks that he's always right. Uh, and so, uh, it is a, it's, but it's a hard term to define. I mean, people call each other fascists all the time when they disagree about something. Or the teenage boy that's not allowed to drive um, calls his father a fascist. And so I think we just kind of throw the term around without understanding fully the connotation of that tribal aspect. And instead of looking for ways to find common ground between groups that disagree um, with each other, it in fact exacerbates those differences so that X leader can have the power to control everything and be a stable genius. You know, <laughs> <laughs> Madeline, as a political science student of the post-war years, we, we all looked at Hitler and Mussolini uh, as envisioning what fascism really was, and it was seen as a, really a right-wing uh, movement that came out of World War I to satisfaction and, and problems with those countries in the wake of it. But what you, as you just said, and I, what I found particularly interesting is, is that you take the ideology away that it's not right wing, but that it's any, any group of authoritarians who claim to take over power and then hold on to it by ruthless means uh, are fascist. Well, the ruthless part is very important because one of the questions is not every um, authoritarian leader is a fascist. Every fascist is an authoritarian leader. But part of the definition is it's somebody who is willing to use force to gain and maintain power, kind of a bully with an army. Um, but the thing that happens and why I do think that there's a, a fascism can come from the left, the difference, frankly, is I, I think the Soviet Union was fascist. Um, that came by by a revolution. Um, I think that uh, the North Koreans, uh, I mean, at this time, the only leader that I would just flat out say is a fascist is the North Korean, Korean leader, Kim Jong-un. So, uh, but I think we have to see it as coming out of the left as well as the right, this gaining of power by one group at the expense of another. Well, one of the, your honesty in writing about this is how you look at our country and how vulnerable we are too to fascism. I mean, we all grew up thinking it was something out of the past and something that ended with World War II and here we are in the 21st century and we're not invulnerable to it in this country. 
Well, do you I, say it that way? I do think that way. And so the book is called Fascism, A Warning. Uh, and there are, I write at the end that some people think the title is alarmist. It's supposed to be. Uh, because I think that we need to understand what the various steps have been. I happen to think that it's important to have historical context for various things. I do teach at Georgetown, and I make it a point of always putting whatever I'm talking about into historical context, which is why the book has so much history in it. But I do think that what we're seeing are divisions um, that are being exacerbated. Um, there are divisions, and again, they're not just in the US, but they are contagious. And so there are differences between urban and rural people. There are those that have been um, felt that they were losing out of uh, modern society for one reason or another. There are those who um, feel that they are being condescended to that the government doesn't represent them, any number of steps. Um, and I, the thing that I do see, frankly, is the identification of one group at the expense of another. Democracy requires majority rule and minority rights. Um, that's why, for instance, Orban, the, the Hungarian leader, talks about illiberal democracy, which is kind of an oxymoron. But the bottom line is it means that it's just majority rule and no minority rights. And so that's something that one has to look at here. Just to get slide off the subject a bit, you mentioned Kim Jong-un in North Korea. You're one of the rare Americans who actually negotiated uh, denuclearization with the North Koreans 10 years ago, 12 years longer ago? Longer than that. Or longer than that. Well, but could you tell us you know, no, what, what your experiences were, which would be fascinating in this day when we're trying to do it again? Well, let me say that um, the North Korean problem has definitely been that since 1953, uh, because there is no peace treaty, or uh, all we have is an armistice. Um, I don't know how many people here have been to the demilitarized zone, which is one of the weirdest places in the world. Um, and really, um, big difference between the democracy of South Korea and the, the blankness and, and uh, uh, tragedy of primitiveness in North Korea. What happened was, and I won't go through the whole story, but when I first got to the UN um, in 93, the North Koreans were threatening to withdraw from the Non-Proliferation Treaty. Um, and so we started trying to figure out how to uh, bring them into compliance with it um, and made, did something called the Agreed Framework, which said that we were going to provide them with some heavy fuel and light water reactors if they gave up their nuclear program. Anyway, we went back and forth an awful lot. And one of the issues with the North Koreans, they are very, um, they don't have much sense of timing in terms of when to bring something up. So what happened in the summer of 2000, or late summer, Vice Marshal Cho, the number two guy, came to the United States, came to my office um, in a pinstriped suit and very diplomatic. And then the next day, we went to the White House, and he had on his uniform with lots of medals for having killed Americans. And, um, but he gave, and you can now see some of the repetition of things, he gave President Clinton a folder in which was a, uh, an invitation for President Clinton to come to North Korea. And President Clinton, I believe wisely said, I, I might come, but it, this has to be prepared, so I'm sending the Secretary of State. They weren't real happy about that. Um, we didn't have a lot of information about the North Koreans. The only thing we knew um, was that, uh, and we were told that uh, by the agency, that, that Kim Jong-il, the father, was crazy and a pervert. I can tell you he wasn't crazy. Um, and. Uh, uh, <laughs> And uh, what was interesting was I had talked to Kim Dae-jung, the president of South Korea, who, similarly to what the current South Korean president has done, introduced something called the sunshine policy. He thought we needed to deal with each other. And I did spend a lot of time with Kim Jong-il talking very specific things about um, their nuclear programs. We were particularly at that time talking about ballistic missiles. By the way, we did know one other thing, and I take full responsibility for Dennis Rodman, because <laughs> what happened, we knew that Kim Jong-il liked basketball. 
So I took over a basketball autographed by Michael Jordan, which they put in their Holy of Holies, so that's the, the problem. But I think the thing that is a tragedy, genuinely, we were, had moved quite far in negotiating with them um, when the election of 2000 happened. Um, and I hold no brief for the North Koreans. There were a lot of Americans that were confused about the election of 2000. They certainly were. Um, and we had, we, Colin Powell was prepared to continue the discussions that I had had. And uh, what happened was the Washington Post had a headline that said, Powell to continue Clinton policies. He was hauled into the Oval and told no way. So we did not follow through on those talks. I can visualize, though, now the following thing. I can't even begin to describe how much we prepared ourselves for all of these meetings. Um, the, the number of people in the State Department that were involved in getting me ready for this. Um, the number of people that had been in negotiations with some of these people before. Um, and um, there were actually note takers in the meetings. And any number of things that would explain where we were. And what bothers me about what has happened now in Singapore, I was actually asked whether it was a win-win or a Kim-win. It was a Kim-win. Um, and uh, we don't have any definition of denuclearization. Um, and we don't um, know, we don't have any verification specifications or even figured out how to get them into place. What is interesting, um, and, and reading in the papers in the last couple of days, Kim Jong-un is now focusing all of a sudden on some of his economic issues. And I do think even a fascist dictator has to sometimes be um, reflective of what's happening to his people. So we'll see where this goes. But at the moment, it's all very kind of uh, hypothetical, if I may say so, uh, because we don't know. The other part that I think was very bad under normal circumstances, when you are going to cancel exercises, you consult with the other people that are involved in it. And as like far the as- Like the Pentagon. Le well, like not just the Pentagon, but also our allies. I mean, um, the South Koreans depend, um, and the Japanese, on our exercises with them. So something was given for which, as far as I can tell, there has been no return. But I'm willing to say that something might have happened that we don't know. But at the moment, it looks like a Kim win. Did you find it strange as a secretary, of, former Secretary of State that the president chose to meet with Kim Jong-un privately, as he did later with Putin, yep. that there was no record of what actually is said or done? Very much so, because part of diplomacy, first of all, it depends on having diplomats. You can't get rid of everybody at the State Department and expect there to be full diplomatic discussions. But you have people there because you do need a record. Um, and so much of diplomacy is based on what had just happened. How did it really work? And so we don't have a record. Um, uh, I do think what's being asked of the interpreters to provide their notes, I have to say I have the highest respect for the interpreters always because you can't carry on diplomacy <clears throat> if you don't understand the language. And they are the ones that provide the texture and all that. But as far as I know, from everything that I saw, they don't actually, they're not stenographers. What they do is they make kind of notes for themselves so that they can remember what has been said so that they can translate it. So some of the discussions now about hauling the stenographer in um, over the uh, uh, Putin meeting, I think is asking that stenographer to do something that's gonna be very hard if it happens. But you need a note taker. I mean, diplomacy is keeping a record and knowing what's been promised and what the other people said. You would think they'd need a Secretary of State in those meetings, too. Well, that, too. Yeah. Uh, you know. <laughs> uh, if the talks go on, as one hears they're trying to have a second round, what do you think needs to be done to get them to advance the situation? With what, what sort of policy would we as a country be able to offer and what would we expect to get back? With North Korea? Yeah. yeah. I think that they um, do, first of all, they are signatories of the Non-Proliferation Treaty. Um, and when they say denuclearization, what they're trying to do is to get us to denuclearize 
while they are not really um, allowing, ver I mean, there has to be some verification. I think that if, and these are big ifs, is if they were willing to, to give up their nuclear weapons um, under a verified um, process where people would be there watching to make sure that they'd done it, and then also the delivery mechanisms for them, and then to destroy some of their facilities. One of the issues that I think um, people don't focus on enough is that there are two ways to get a nuclear weapon. One is plutonium and one is highly enriched uranium. And part of the thing that has been happening, they might say they've done something on plutonium, but they've been cheating on the uh, highly enriched uranium. I think the part that is very hard in terms of just thinking about it in terms of diplomacy, and people are, look at what happened on the Iranian deal, um, it's when you're a diplomat, you either, there are two ways of doing things, you try to negotiate things in, in, chewo, in doable pieces, basically, or you have a whole comprehensive thing and then you're able to do a whole bunch of trade-offs. But the bottom line is, on dealing with the nuclear, I think you have to do it in pieces. And in so many ways, the Iran deal was a very good model for it. By the president saying that it was a bad deal, I think he's kind of got himself in a box of saying he has to do everything in North Korea in order to have it be valid, and there's no way to really do all that. So, but I do think the thing that has to happen, they have to give up their nuclear weapons in a verifiable way and not have a delivery system um, to uh, deliver it against South Korea or Japan or us. To get back to your warnings about fascism, you declare in your book that our current president is the most anti-democratic president in modern history. Is that right? Yeah, well, in, I have what resisted <laughs> calling him a fascist. Yeah. Um, I do not call there him a go. fascist on purpose because um, if I, as I had my definition of fascism, the identification with one group, the discrimination against the other, but the use of force to achieve what you want. And so he is not a fascist. But I do think he's the most undemocratic president in modern American history. And the reason that I say that is that he has no respect for the institutions that we have, um, including the judiciary, which he either packs or ignores and uh, deprecates by saying they're Mexican-American uh, by birth. Um, he then also has no respect for the press. I find it stunning. The freedom of the press is the basis of our democracy. And to use a term that the Russians and the communists use, enemy of the people, um, is uh, beyond outrageous in terms. He also then, um, in fact, has no sense about the history of how decisions are made. Um, and he has, but I do say the, he was elected. Um, and so I think that is one of the questions that we have to look at. But the main problem is that he has undemocratic tendencies and also does think that he knows everything and he does not use a decision-making process that makes any sense. You also say that history has shown that freedom demands that people stand up and defend it, and well, that lies should be countered at all times. What do you think the country should be doing to deal with an elected president who seems to have gone off the skids in many ways? Well, let me say this. I, we all know the, the statement, see something, say something. I have added to that, do something. So my to-do list is the following. It's, first of all, is we have to call it out. We cannot normalize what's going on. Um, I think the, the whole attack on the press is, is basic. Uh, the lack of understanding of our constitutional structure, all that. Then I think that people should either run for office themselves or support the people that are. Um, that is what democracy really is about, is going out, and, and the privilege of voting. I think we don't recognize that enough, and I think that what is interesting is that uh, there are people who've decided it's not worth voting. That is not true, that people have to vote, and we have to help people to register to do that. Then I really do think one of the hard parts to do um, is how to talk to people you disagree with. 
Um, I think that's one of the things that has to happen. I think one of the problems that we have is um, that we, people get their information from a source that they already agree with and don't listen to what they disagree with. Some of you have heard me say this, but I live in Washington, and those of you um, that live there should know that I'm a very dangerous driver because I listen to right-wing radio um, <laughs> as I drive. And so I yell a lot and have a lot of hand gestures, uh, and at some point I'm going to get arrested. But the bottom line is I listen. I do listen to what they have to say. And I think that rather than just dismissing what people that we disagree with are saying, I think we need to be respectful. I've said I don't like the word tolerance. It means tolerate, to put up with. Instead, what I think we need to know is what is motivating the people and be respectful of discussions. Then I have to tell you that there isn't a book or a speech ever given that Robert Frost isn't quoted in. Um, and so I did that in my book. And so Robert Frost says the older he gets, the younger are his teachers. And I think that what the young people have been doing is really remarkable, especially those high schoolers that went out and uh, demonstrated and marched and held town hall meetings. And so, by the way, old people don't want to be called old. Um, uh, we, we call ourselves perennials, so the perennials need to <laughs> deal with the millennials uh, in terms of trying to figure out. But the to-do list is very important, and everybody can create their own to-do list. And then um, one of the things that I uh, wrote about at the end, and I just want to go through this a little bit, is that we need to ask ourselves a bunch of questions. And, um, and why we've gotten into this in terms of the issues, and if, uh, if I may, um, and, and I am a professor and I've learned to, to ask myself when I'm not getting good answers, whether it's because I've been kind of looking in the, uh, not looking in the right places. So I think now as democratic citizens, we need to, um, we haven't really formed the right questions. So let me just list some of my own. Uh, we should begin by asking what our prospective leaders want us to think and feel. Do they cater to our prejudices by suggesting that we treat people outside our ethnicity, race, creed, or party as unworthy of respect? Do they want us to nurture our anger toward those whom we believe have done us wrong? Do they encourage us to have contempt for our governing institutions, the independent media, and the courts? Do they go beyond asking for our votes to brag about their ability to solve all problems and satisfy every desire? Do they solicit our cheers by speaking casually and with pumped up machismo about using violence to blow enemies away? Do they echo the attitude of Mussolini? And the quote is, the crowd doesn't have to know, all it has to do is believe and submit to being shaped. Or do they invite us to join with them to build and maintain a healthy center for our societies, a place where rights and duties are apportioned fairly and all have room to dream and grow? And so the answers to these questions are not really going to tell us um, whether a prospective leader is left or right wing or conservative or liberal um, in the American context, Democrat or Republican, but it does kind of tell us a little bit more about what direction that leader wants to go in. And so. I do think that we need to see our responsibility as voters more and not think that um, if we don't vote or don't ask the questions or don't stand up that somehow this is going to go away because it won't if we aren't active participants. Thank you, Madeline. One final question before I turn this over to the audience for your questions that, to Madeline Albright. You've been traveling a lot and seeing a lot of your former colleagues, uh, foreign ministers of different allied countries. What are you finding there as they look at our country today? Well, first of all, let me just say, um, there's no way to, without sounding totally nostalgic and sentimental, there is no better job in the world than being Secretary of State and representing the United States, and to have a chance to sit behind that sign, especially if you're a refugee, as I am. And so um, I think the important part was understanding what the role of the United States has been um, in the modern era. And I have to say that as a, somebody born in Czechoslovakia, uh, Munich was the watershed event. Um, and the British and French made an agreement with the Germans and Italians over the heads of the Czechoslovaks and sold the country down the river. America was not there. 
Then, as a child in London during the Blitz, and later when the Americans came, I was a little girl, everything changed. Then, when after uh, the war, an agreement was made between the, uh, our side and the Soviets um, in terms of dividing Europe, and the country I was born in was behind the Iron Curtain for 50 years. And so, America, I could go on, but America's role in the world has been dispositive as far as I'm concerned. Um, what happened when I got to the UN was right after a time there'd been a lot of foreign policy made by the previous administrations and President Clinton had said it's the economy stupid and we had to kind of worry about ourselves. But he also said that we were the indispensable nation. I just said it so often that it became identified with me. There's nothing about the word indispensable, however, that says alone. And for me, the thing that has to happen is the United States has to be engaged. We are the most powerful country in the world. We are not victims. Um, and so what I found going to Europe now, and, and I was there just kind of during the time as the president had begun his NATO uh, and that trip and then moving through Putin, was basically that they don't know what we're doing. Um, and they feel that uh, we are... Uh, not at all sure, clear about what, you know, we've just accused everybody of being free riders, but we have not really shown what our role in things are. And so, and I have to say, the hardest thing for a former diplomat is to be abroad and not support your president. And yet, um, you have to have a certain amount of credibility. And I think that they don't know what we're doing. And they keep asking whether it's the end of the Western world, whether the United States is fed up with all of them, that we are not going to play any role, that they're on their own uh, and subject to their political problems, which also are divided societies. So I think very, very confused and troubled um, and wanting to know whether the United States understands what our role is in the 21st century. I think um, that part of the issue and uh, is that President Clinton was very concerned about building bridges to the 21st century. We knew that organizations would have to change. I mean, basically, people and institutions at age 70 need a little refurbishing. So the bottom line is the institutions can be changed. The trade agreements can be updated, but there has to be some logic, some preparation, and we have confused and troubled our very best friends. Confused our very nation, too. And our very nation, too. Uh, let's have questions from the audience. We have another 15 minutes. Uh, please uh, speak to the microphone so we can actually hear the question. Could you please tell us about the pin you're wearing today? <laughs> well, so uh, the pin I'm wearing today is Mercury the Messenger because I really do think I have a message. So that is why I'm wearing it. And in case people want to know why you would want to know, um, my pins have become part of diplomacy. I've had a lot of fun with them. The queen has actually taken it up. <laughs> <laughs> there was a question way down there, all the way down. Uh, Madam Secretary, thank you for a great book. Anybody who hasn't bought it, go out and buy it. Um, Thomas Friedman uh, seems to connect the dots between climate change, the refugee crisis, political disruption and nationalism, and perhaps fascism. And I, I wonder if you would comment on that, and also if it continues, and Mother Nature continues in this direction, and we have, this is just the tip of the melting iceberg, What could happen in the future? Um, I think that's a very wide and good question. Let me just say the following thing. Is the following, that what is true, I have spent some time talking about megatrends, and one megatrend is globalization. And I think most of the people in this room have benefited from globalization. But it does have a downside. It's faceless. And so people want to know what their identities are, uh, whether it's linguistic, nationalistic, ethnic, etc., which is fine, that's patriot, uh, patriotic. But when my identity hates your identity, it's nationalism and hyper-nationalism is very dangerous. And Europe, for its own political reasons, has gone through this nationalist phase. 
Um, and at the same time, there are the problems that are coming out. We were, Lauren, talking about the Middle East, most complicated place um, in so many different ways. And people are trying to escape um, what is um, terrorism in their own countries in the Middle East, uh, killings by their leader, as is the case in Syria, and they will need to go somewhere. So all of a sudden, they are the ones that are, it's a, uh, I just did a study, I do believe in bipartisanship with Steve Hadley about what is going on in the modern Middle East, and it's a crisis in the Middle East that is spreading out, and that in the, in the guise of the, of, the, of the refugees that need to go somewhere. And so they are all of a sudden part of the, quote, problem in countries that are trying to define their own identity, are having economic problems, need a scapegoat, so that is part of that story. The same thing is true of the um, environmental aspects. Uh, people, primarily the people that are um, the immigrants from um, Africa where um, there's desertification, not enough water, et cetera, uh, want to leave in order to have a life, and they also are now spreading all that. And so the refugees are all of a sudden, and the immigrants are being blamed for all the problems when they in fact are victims themselves. And the question is, what responsibilities do we all owe to each other? Um, I am a refugee, and a very grateful one. Um, and, um, and I think that it's very hard for the United States to tell everybody what to do on this issue when our numbers keep coming down. Um, and um, anybody that uh, has driven across or around America know that we have a lot of room um, and that uh, we need to be taking more people. Um, and it, 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 I think it, it enriches the culture, not uh, tears it down. And if you're operating under scapegoatism or the fear factor, then you don't want anybody that doesn't look exactly or act like you. So it's, they, I agree with Tom on this, is that basically what you're seeing in the people are, they are the victims of the problem um, and we don't understand enough about what's causing it and once we decide that the United States has no interest in it and that vict they, we are the victim, we aren't going to do anything and we're going to build walls instead of bridges. <clears throat> All the way down, please. Right, right there, the last one. Yeah, right there. Thank you. Madam Secretary, do you see any similarities between Helsinki and Munich? And what? Helsinki. Munich. Helsinki and Munich. Munich. Helsinki, yes. Um, <laughs> it's very interesting that you say that, because I do. Um, and I do think the word appeasement came up over Munich when there was such a desire um, to avoid any problem that Neville Chamberlain basically said, um, that people could sleep soundly. Um, President Trump said the same thing about being able to sleep soundly. And I think that the lesson out of Munich, I think, is that you have to stand up to evil. And I think we don't understand enough of what Putin is trying to do. And I'd like to just take a minute to, I did a lot of um, survey work in, in across all of Europe after the end of the Cold War. And it was a very professional set of work with people that were uh, professionals in being able to ask a question so you actually got an answer. And then we had focus groups. And I will never forget a man in a focus group outside of uh, Moscow who got up and said, I'm so embarrassed. We used to be a superpower and now we're Bangladesh with missiles. And so this country, kind of Russia, lost its kind of sense of greatness Putin is now the embodiment of somebody that wants to return greatness to Russia. Putin is a KGB agent. He has played a weak hand really, really well. Um, he has been able to reassert um, influence in the Middle East, and he has also been able to do something which is to divide us from our allies. They have a capability of using it. They have weaponized information, and I have said that Trump is the gift that keeps giving to Putin. Um, and so that is why I do think that there is some similarity between Munich and Helsinki. Wow. Uh, yes. 
Thank, right, thank you. you for your spending your time with us today. Um, I'm, I'm interested in your view on um, the uh, immigration problems from Central America. I mean, it appears as though um, all these people are fleeing essentially failed states, uh, unable to protect their citizens and um, give them an opportunity to live. Is there anything that the United States can do other than build a wall to, um, to help out the people in those countries and change that dynamic? Well, my sense is, and I, I mentioned this, is I do think that people would prefer to live in the country where they were born. They know the language, they have their families and infrastructure, and so therefore there is a question about what can be done to make people uh, capable. They can't live in the countries because they can't make a living. Um, and so I do think that we need to do something. What's been very interesting, um, Aspen has just had this action forum, and um, Aspen has been doing the Institute um, leaders. They have programs for leaders from various parts of the world, and I met with the Central Americans just now. Um, and, of course, the big story there all of a sudden is Nicaragua, where uh, fighting is taking place. Um, I think, and also uh, Bill mentioned that I was chairman of the board of the National Democratic Institute. I think what we have to do is help countries um, to have democracy deliver. Um, and there's always this argument between economic development and political development. And I have said, because people want to vote and eat, we have to talk about the economic development and then try to help on some of the infrastructure. Um, and I do think that we need to devote some of our aid programs to making those countries livable. But it is hard. There is the drug problem. There is the fact that their institutions are fragile. Um, but it's going to require uh, cooperation, not condescension, but cooperation with the idea that people do want to live where they were born. On the other hand, I also think what is happening on our borders is un-American. Um, and cruel in every single way. Um, and I think that people need to, we need to speak out about the fact that it is not American to separate children from their parents without any kind of records of anything, and a wall isn't going to help. Um, and so I do think there have to be some active measures in trying to improve the life in those countries. So the question way in the back. Please. Uh, thank you, Madam Secretary, for coming and also bringing to a point, I think, something that's been on a lot of our minds. In 1981, in my living room in Telluride, I was sitting with 20 Chilean refugees who had fled the Allende coup. And BB turned to me and said, you know, what we all talk about is the next time fascism strikes, it will be in the United States. And if I'm not mistaken, we're really close to that. My question for you is, because of your knowledge of state history from the inside, do you know of countries which have been at the stage we're at now, and I suspect it's much worse than we know, with advancing fascism, the story of which mostly historic that I'm aware of is it just keeps rolling until it works its way out. Are there countries in your knowledge which have been in the state we're in who have turned this around? And if so, how? What do we do now? Well, um, the truth is nothing quite like us because we're the world's old, oldest democracy um, and also um, because the problem kind of is built on something different that wasn't there before in terms of the economic divisions created by developments in technology that we haven't prepared for. But I do think that there are countries um, that have had uh, serious issues and problems uh, that keep pushing back a little bit um, and that need our support. But there's not a lot of history in kind of gotten as far as we've gotten without people standing up and speaking out in a, or um, a war. And so I think that that's, that's the warning, basically, is that it's hard to replicate America's history anywhere else. I mean, there are elections that have been held. I mean, for instance, very interesting, I don't know the answer to this, but it's worth watching what's just been happening in Pakistan. Um, whether um, a government that was more and more 
um, under the control of military. There's a new election. Theoretically, that person is also under the control of military, but it's the biggest new election. Another one is Zimbabwe that is happening just as we speak, of countries where their Mugabe, who was president for a very long time, dominating everything, a coup, all kinds of things. So there are more current examples rather than something historical um, on the prevention of it that is exactly like ours, which is why I wanted to write the book to show that the countries that ultimately succumbed to fascism were democracies, or democratic means were used to, to get them in. So, um, but I, it's hard to think of an exact example. Yeah. I think we have time for two more questions. Right here. No, behind you, Bill. Sorry, not you. Madam Secretary, uh, in my opinion, uh, fascism also is centered in personality or character. Uh, recently, it appears that our president is attempting to replace the Western alliance with an alliance of strongmen around the world. Uh, are we in danger from that of becoming close to dictatorial company or countries and uh, or do you think our institutions will prevail in the long run? Well, um, let me just say, I'm often asked if I'm a pessimist or an optimist. I'm an optimist who worries a lot. Um, and what I'm worried about, which is why I did write the book, is that we are not paying enough attention to this in terms of um, kind of thinking, isn't it uh, kind of interesting that he happens to like Putin better um, than Macron, or um, everything is determined by the handshake. Uh, and so um, I think that the issue here is how we strengthen our institutions. So one of the things that I've been doing, um, you all know, the first article of the Constitution is the power of Congress. And I have been going up to the Hill a lot and talking about it, saying it's Article I time, which is why these elections this year are so important. Um, and I don't want to tell anybody how to vote. I think we have to vote um, and have respect for those that we disagree with. But I do think Article I and Congress has to be strengthened. I think the judicial story is more complicated because the Supreme Court issue but I do think we also have to speak out about the power of, Cong of uh, the judicial branch, and then not just because I'm sitting with a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, but we have to strengthen and, um, the role of the press, there's no question, and uh, call it out and not put up with the fake news thing or the enemy of the people. The hard part, I truly, and we talked about this a little bit, I think that, um, I go back to reading a lot of different, I read four newspapers every morning, and it's always a slightly different story, but you need to do that, and I think we need to strengthen the press. So run for office, support those who are running, and remember Article One at this point. We got time for one more question. Good, right, right there, thank you. Do you have an opinion about the current Secretary of State? No, <laughs> um, he has a great job. Uh, 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 now, let me say the following thing, which is, it is a wonderful job in every single way. Um, and I think, um, I listened very carefully to his confirmation hearings, and I was very glad to hear that he was planning to resuscitate the State Department um, and argue more for its budget and also for democracy programs. Um, he has, um, I think, a very hard job one of the interesting parts is um, I, I teach a course on decision making and the relationship of the Secretary of State with the President is obviously key, but also is the whole thing known as the Principles Group, which is, uh, is supposed to meet under a, uh, an honest broker national security advisor um, and have collaboration between the State Department, the Defense Department, all the national security departments, and it's a little hard to tell how they all are working. Um, so 
Um, I am not prepared to make a judgment about Secretary Pompeo at the moment. Um, he's got a very hard job in terms of finding out what happened in those meetings. Um, and um, then in, in the way that he deals with others. But since this is the last question, I will say um, one of the things, I don't know how many of you watch Madam Secretary, but uh, the opening season on October 7th, uh, Colin Powell and Hillary Clinton and I um, are in it. Um, and um, a line that I got in there, unscripted, was, thanking Tay Leone for calling us all together and saying how wonderful it is when a sitting Secretary of State actually consults with her predecessors because we used to do it all the time. Thank you, Madeline. <laughs> buy the book, buy the book. It's a really important book for America.